Okay, so um, can everybody hear me? Peg, can you hear me? Yes, you're fine. Okay, thanks. Volume is about right, is it? Yes. Okay, thanks. Great, so so here we are on on the second day, second morning for those of us in uh, the u s second morning, second day, perhaps second evening for some of this retreat called original love called Original Love Part Two, so to speak, Zone Two. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'll address a little bit this term, Original Love, but um, that aside, just, excuse me, just organizing things here. But um, <clears throat> leaving aside the term Original Love, just for the moment, just for the moment, this second retreat on support you know the first one was really essentially about developing our capacity for being aware mindfully aware in the present moment and um that's uh something in a sense we need to develop ourselves we can have quite a bit of guidance but um, nobody can do the work for us in a sense. It's like, you know, the analogy would be going to a gym and being shown how to use the equipment, but you can't, you can't sort of get anywhere unless you're going to the gym and actually putting in the hours yourself. You know, that's just sort of unavoidable. That the heavy lifting, so to speak, is done by us as practitioners. So same, same is just the way it is in meditation. But th that, that was sort of, you know, first zone of development in, in having a meditation practice, retreat number one. Retreat number two, and by the way, this is not sequential, actually. All these zones coexist always. So this second zone and the message of this retreat is very simple and in the sort of tumble of yesterday's talk, I don't know how clearly I really <laughs> conveyed this. I'm hoping to, you know, a little bit more uh, clearly make this point today. The message of this retreat is this, there is help. That's it. If you just get that and receive it, there is help. Then you've got this retreat. Uh, it's very easy to cognitively just acknowledge that and sign off on it. Yeah, I get it. Okay, there's sort of help. But I'm not really, that's not what I'm really trying to convey. I want you to take it in. We live in perhaps the most individualist society and culture there's ever been. I don't, I don't know, but some say that. This modern Western way and world is supremely individualist. There's a, there's a great side to that. There's, you know, freedom for self actualization for some, for some, not all by any means. A lot of people are oppressed in this modern world. But in theory, you know, for some at least, there's 
great freedom for self-expression, self-actualization. Um, but what a huge cost it also exacts on us when we feel we have to do everything ourselves and it's all down to us. The message of this retreat is wrong. There is help. Um, this help comes in more kind of, you know, apparent, manifest, ordinary sort of forms, so to speak. But it also comes in less familiar, less apparent forms. And um, I want to talk about both, really, this morning. Um, <clears throat> of course, you know, it's help when you, you know, if you're sort of 21st century person, you switch on your phone, you go to an app, and there's meditation guidance and a timer and, you know, a voice helping you settle into your practice and guiding you in it. That's help. Good. Good. Um, if, and, you know, that may serve you for quite a while. Um, if you're less sort of uh, iPhone oriented, smartphone oriented, you know, of course, there's uh, the old... <laughs> analog forms of help people like me you know analog help um and many other teachers you know flesh and flesh and bones you know willing to offer help and guidance that's also available and actually you know in our zen world we would say that if you want to really follow the path um you know quite sort of seriously at some point you may need a flesh and blood guide and it's a person you know it's a, it's it's in front of you it's manifest it's not it's not weird and mysterious it's just uh, somebody who's hopefully embodying the teachings and the the way and uh, the handed down guidance methods and um, devices and tools, upaya, skillful means that have come down in the tradition, you know, that they've learned at least to some extent to embody them, to live them, internalize them, and to share them. And uh, again, that's not sort of mysterious, you know, straightforward. It's very, it's, it's, it's remarkable in how it helps. It may help much more than we think it could. I mean, if I may just reference back to the talk yesterday with that dream I mentioned where, you know, that sort of chaotic, slightly chaotic retreat workshop where, you know, as a, the, the, the participants may sort of thought they knew what they were signing on for and what kind of retreat it was. And then all of a sudden the, the apparently sort of ill-prepared <laughs> leader of the retreat suddenly has sort of dropped everybody into a far deeper place and that's where the retreat was aiming at and it couldn't really get us there in straightforward ways because what it's aiming at is something outside our known map of things that's a bit like this practice is that i mean there's a level on which it can be a known map achieving known objectives like you know stress reduction as fairly much meeting the need on the same level that the need is expressed and known but then there's deeper <clears throat> stuff that goes on in this practice which is you know we hear words like awakening kensho you know enlightenment even and um, or original love, you know, and we, we sort of, uh, we may have an idea, some sort of cipher in our minds of what that means, but we've got no idea, actually, because by its very nature, it is exactly opening up to what we do not know. You know, it is, if we know it, then it's not awakening. You know, the, the, it's awakening from what we know. 
And that's where, <clears throat> in a sense, emissaries from, from that unknown land, if I can put it like that, can come and help us. Some of these are a bit more tangible, like a koan. You know, you sit with a koan moo. It's sort of, you kind of know, in a sense, you know, I got this little verbal formulation and I got to sit with it, uh, you know, and it's, I, I, it comes along with my breath that I also know, kind of know what that is, you know, breath, breathing, I know it. So you sort of have a sense of knowing, but you actually at the same time, we really don't know where this little koan wants to take us or where in a sense it's come from. It's come from a land, a world that is totally ours, but we just don't know it, you know? And it, it wants to take us as an invitation from the land of the unknown, you could say. Um, <clears throat> now, one way that in, in, in the tradition, um, help has been uh, parsed out is in um, what's known as the three treasures, three jewels, three gems. And actually, our, you know, our lineage, San Bo, that's what its name means, three treasures, San Bo, three treasures. And the three treasures are Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And these two can be sort of understood, met, encountered on different levels sort of more straightforward and a bit more unknown. So on the straightforward level, you know, Buddha is Shakyamuni Siddhartha Gautama, the person who went through his, his, uh, his, his quest, his search, and, and went through this sort of shift and profound sort of transformation as a human being, and then taught about it. So that's, you know, Buddha is both you know, the person like us who's seeking some kind of relief, release, some kind of, uh, um, you know, deeper engagement with and understanding of being human, what it is to be human. Um, he's a, a, a figure, a person who did the practice, who shows us, in a sense, left the example, the model of practicing, you know, in a big part of that for him was um, uh, meditation. Uh, that wasn't the only part, actually. There was living ethically, living kindly, wisely, and sort of more gently on the earth, giving things time, giving his own self time, giving life time. You know, sort of leaving the, the, the busy, busy life of the palace in the terms of the mythology, leaving that behind, going into the forest, letting go of human time, clock time, entering forest time. And it's different. The rhythm of the trees that live four or five hundred years you know, all the generations of leaves that come and go and the, the many other beings living in their own rhythms, their own pace, sort of entering that wider time. That's what we do when we sit. I mean, that's one of the, one of the things that may be a little harder to get when we're meditating with an iPhone or an app. It's somehow how to, how to actually leave that um you know tech tech technocracy that you know um it's not quite the word i want like the rule the the rule of technology you know with its pace fast pace and how to leave that actually and let ourselves expand into a broader sense of time like buddha did that's part of our part of our practice part of our help from his example. Um, 
then there's Dharma, the teaching Buddha left that has been handed down all these years, all these centuries. Um, and Sangha, community, quite simply sitting together, practicing together, community of fellow practitioners, that's Sangha. Um, so that's fairly on, those levels are fairly sort of straightforward, but that's not quite enough actually to cover it because, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in many parts of the world where Buddhism is followed and practiced, it's, Buddha would, would be actually not really uh, primarily for the great majority, I think, of Buddhists experienced in that kind of way I've just outlined. The figure of Buddha would be more like, say, the figure of Jesus in, for Christians or, you know, Moses for Jews or Muhammad and for, for Muslims. You know, it, it's more of a, you know, a kind of archetypal entity who can sort of come and help you and that kind of thing. And, you know, more traditionally sort of religious, really, kind of figure. So actually, I want to, in this talk, I want to try to speak a little bit to that kind of level. And in a way, in a sense, how to sort of reclaim some, some uh, openness to um, the help of, can I say, sort of non-material entities and figures that might be associated more with traditional religion. But um, even if we're not subscribing to that kind of, you know, old view of religion, um, old forms of spiritual life, um, which for some people aren't old, I know, they're still alive and well. But, you know, for a more of a sort of non-theistic kind of approach to spiritual life, can we still be open to that kind of help in a sense, at least having a sense that there's help we don't really know about so clearly or we can't understand so clearly, but still can be open to. Now, I'm, I'm going to make a little bit of a, a defense or an apology or a, in the old sense of apology, you know, like defense of that kind of having that kind of openness as a Zen sitter, as a, medita as a meditator, as somebody who really doesn't subscribe to um, a theistic faith at all. And yet, still, I feel myself that um, there are, there's a realm of our experience which is somehow helpful to be open to that um, involves kind of archetypal support, if I can put it that way. I, I don't think it's essential, <laughs> but I think it's helpful. So let's see if I can offer some kind of a, a, a way for, for us to open to that, perhaps. Now, on this level, Buddha, again, is not actually just the sort of example of 2,500, 2,400 years ago, but also somehow a bit more alive today. The masters, you know, who, and teachers who we encounter in stories and in koans and in um, sutras, you know, in a certain way, they're transcending time. They can actually um, be met today, even though they may have lived 800 or 1200 or 2000 years ago. In a sense, we can, we can receive their help more directly. Now, and maybe this is sounding a bit strange, but let me, let me now sort of make a little defense of this kind of talk. Um, in, um, I think I need to, yeah, switch, to, <laughs> switch gear a little bit. Um, in, you know, Jung's, Jung's work and <clears throat> development as a psychologist, you know, many of you will know he's got interested in shamanism. And he realized, uh, he wasn't the first, of course, that um, shamanic practice around the world had a lot of odd parallels, no matter whether you're looking at shamanism in Siberia, Lapland, Amazonia, Africa, 
a lot of things were common in these places that, you know, where presumably indigenous folks had not had uh, connections to one another, you know, and yet they have very, very similar worldviews and similar experiences when going on shamanic, uh, ritualistic shamanic journeys. The shamans would typically, you know, have a three world system that they went to, an upper world, a middle world, a lower world, wherever, you know, wherever on earth they were practicing, they'd be doing that. They would often travel from between the worlds by means of a world tree or a world river. Sometimes the drum actually, and the drum stick that would sort of be part of the ceremony were viewed as a, a canoe and a paddle to travel down the world river or up the world river. They would meet animal entities. They would meet sort of spirit entities, divinities, deities, powers, you know, and have to kind of sometimes sort of negotiate with them, tussle with them, make exchanges in order to sort of come back to the human realm with some healing having been done. Um, now, um, what, what Jung came up with, as many of you know, is this term, the collective unconscious. The idea being that sort of in the human unconscious, there's levels of it, that part, zones of it that are personal you know, to the individual. But there's also levels of the unconscious that are collective, that are shared among all people. Now, this is a, maybe a little bit of a difficult um, idea to swallow. I don't know. Um, but I, um, I'm going to, again, just sort of bring in another angle here. A, a great French scholar, Henri Corbin, working in the mid 20th century in Paris, he came up with a term, the mundus imaginalis, or imaginal world, that he felt um, was a kind of realm of consciousness that humans, and this, this is a you know, serious scholar, not a religious practitioner. I mean, not that the two are necessarily have to be separate, but in his case, it was all about his scholarship. He felt that there was a kind of realm humans could sort of go to in their imaginations that was not just imaginary to them, but had a sort of shared reality to it. That, I mean, so I don't know how clearly I'm conveying this, how weird it's sounding, but let me just, in his work, he was looking at a, a, a kind of Sufi tale where a, um, in the tale, a person would go to a realm beyond the mountains in the West. And that's where the tale would take place. And when they were there, it was as if it was sort of uh, 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 an area of reality and it had its own laws and its own sort of rules and authorities. And the individual had to kind of uh, s submit to those laws and, and, and would come back changed for the better. It's sort of a place of healing. So, so it's a little bit like the shamanic worlds. It's also a little bit like the way Jung developed his own dream work. He felt that in dreams, people are sort of taken to a, a, a realm like that, archetypal, imaginal, in the sense that it's got some even though it's imaginary, it's, it's got some shared properties among people. And that there, um, there are figures that are not um, flesh and blood, but somehow uh, have properties that pertain to all of us, something like that. And anyway, I don't know, I'm making a little bit, I'm a little bit of a mess of this, I think. I'm not feeling that I can, I'm conveying it quite as clearly as I, as I sometimes can do, I think. But do you get the idea that it's not, you don't have to be, you know, uh, devoutly religious. You can actually be 
relatively, you know, materialist or at least non-theistic and still be open to the possibility that actually our consciousness contains levels, dimensions, where there is sort of intrinsic help available. And my contention would be when we sit, as we let go more of our need to know, need to have an understanding, we can actually open up and become a little bit more porous, permeable, available to receiving help and guidance from, uh, I suppose, especially figures in our traditions, you know, and that actually will help us um, on another level, we're sort of deeper in our psyches somehow, we're getting um, adjusted, um, aligned, opened in ways that are not so known to us just by sitting, just by hearing teachings, just by sitting with a koan. That it's not, it's not, and I want to, you know, one thing I do want to make clear is that even though I'm sort of talking like this, this kind of support that can come to us, um, it's not what, you know, the Zen tradition would understand by awakening. Not at all. It's still, you know, essentially dualistic. It's still, you know, there's a self of me, a person being helped, so to speak, by others. Um, so we're still, you know, we're still, I'm still offering all this in, you know, in praise of dualism, of being, it's fine to be a self. You know, that's how we, most of us feel. And it's fine to practice feeling that. But the invitation here is to just slightly sort of loosen our understanding of things. And just be not quite so beholden, so um, attached to our understanding and letting kind of things be a bit more mysterious. And it's why when we go walking off in nature, you know, we, we do soften our boundaries, our, our known uh, ways that things are, can soften, dissolve a little bit. The boundaries dissolve a little bit. You know, we, we realize sometimes that we're in the presence of other kinds of existence that are very different to ours. And that's salutary for us. You know, whether the rhythm of the mountain ranges moving or the rhythm of the trees and forests growing and sustaining themselves over such long spans of time, not just the individual trees, but the whole forest, you know, being um, more available to these kind of time spans, these other ways of existing, it's salutary for us to be open to being um, touched by them. You know, sort of on that kind of level I'm, I'm talking. Um, <clears throat> now, I want to give you an example, a beautiful example of this sort of realm from um, great, great novel that I'm deep in at the moment. Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky, um, that I, I sort of, uh, you know, never read until now. Actually, I read various other Dostoevsky novels, but somehow was always a bit daunted by, by this one. And actually, to be honest, I think I was a bit put off because there's a section of it that gets commonly um, quoted, uh, excerpted and quoted. Some of you might have seen it. You'll find it in anthologies and things about the Grand Inquisitor. It's a famous little episode. And I, I don't know, I, I never was particularly taken by that. And somehow uh, it's very misleading in terms of what the rest of the novel is actually like. And I want to just read this bit where um, I hope this will give you a sense 
again, of just what it's like to open to help without really knowing where the help's coming from. Trusting that there's a sort of broader world right here than we know. And that, again, this is not about, quote unquote, awakening to the, to the, you know, the non-duality of self and other. It's not about that. It still has self and other. But it's lessening, weakening, uh, you know, dissolving our known boundaries. It's just being more open, being more open, more receptive. And that's okay. You know, it's, we might think that's not, I've got to do everything myself. This is the opposite of that. You don't have to do everything yourself. What is it like to just, you know, loosen the hold? So here's an example. This is a, I'm going to sort of dive right into the middle of this amazing scene. Um, this is one of the brothers, Alyosha, is a young novice monk, totally devoted to this elder called Father Zosimo, who's a really, a really marvelous sort of spiritual example of a deep spiritual man. Uh, wonderful to read about in the book. Um, and at this point, he's just died. And Alyosha, the young monk, is sort of, is kind of devastated. Um, sort of, you know, for two th reasons, actually. Firstly, because his teacher has died. And he really is a teacher. He's not like a typical priest or something. Not at all. Very different kind of man. Really, I hope you'll read it at some point. Um, <clears throat> He's died, but actually there's another reason that Alyosha is just very uh, torn up at the moment, which is this, it's a little strange, but this elder was revered by, you know, his followers and, and a lot of people uh, in the vicinity and wider as a kind of sage and healer. And, you know, people would bring um, the sick and, and, uh, disabled folks to be healed by him and, and that kind of thing. He was um, very, very sort of modest about all this, he didn't understand why they were coming, and, you know, whatever, but he had this kind of following. But there was a belief among um, the folks, the religious folks then in Russia, that these sort of semi-saint-like figures, when they died, their bodies, wouldn't smell. <laughs> that was a, a sign of their saintliness, that they would have no odor of corruption. They were so holy and hallowed that they, their flesh wouldn't smell as it decayed. And actually, Father Zosimo, even after being dead for only a few hours, starts to smell. <laughs> And they're all sort of, all his followers are dismayed, you know, because they had this, I suppose, sort of superstition really around it. And it gave um, fuel to all the people, some of the monks didn't believe in him. They didn't sort of follow him. There was some division within the community around him. And so it gives kind of fodder to all the ones who are critical of him. They're all delighted that he's smelling. <laughs> And, but all the followers, like Alyosha, are dismayed. So Alyosha has been in sort of despair for 24 hours about this. And then he comes back to, to the room where Father Zosima is laid out in his coffin. And all the while, there's been a monk um, standing sort of nearby with a big volume of the scriptures on a lectern reading, reading, reading from the Gospels. That was the tradition over the dead body. Somebody's there just reading for, I don't know, a day or two, nonstop. And there's a couple of them have been taking turns. So Lyosha comes back from actually having had to deal with all kinds of problems with his family who live in the town. And he comes back to visit and spend some time with the, the corpse of his beloved deceased uh, teacher, elder, and, um, and the, the reading is going on, and it's about the wedding in Cana, 
which is the time when Jesus turned water to wine. And I believe it was his first miracle. And Alyosha is exhausted. He hasn't slept in 36 hours or something. And he's sort of in the room, on his knees, sort of near the coffin, kind of, I guess, praying or, but sort of nodding off in and out of sleep. And he goes into this kind of half awake, half sleeping, half dreaming, half visionary kind of state. So I'm just going to read some of this. Um, um, he's at the, uh, this is Alyosha. And he's hearing the reading. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine, Alyosha heard. And then he, this is Alyosha thinking, ah, yes, I was missing that. And I didn't want to miss it. I love that passage. It's Cana of Galilee, the first miracle. Ah, that miracle, that sweet miracle. It was not men's grief, but their joy Christ visited. He worked his first miracle to help people's gladness. He who loves people loves their gladness too. It was Father Zosima's, one of his favorite ideas. He who loves people loves their gladness too. There's no living without joy. Yes, everything that is true and good is always full of forgiveness, Father Zosima used to say. Isn't that sweet? Everything that is true and good is always full of forgiveness. That was the elder. This is Henry saying, isn't that beautiful? Jesus, Jesus said unto her, um, why don't we, let's see, sorry. This is all about the wine. Um, Jesus saith unto them that were there, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, the, the host, and they bear it. And when the host had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew it knew where it came from, the host called the bridegroom and saith unto him, at the beginning of a feast, people set forth good wine. And when people have drunk well, they set forth less good wine. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. That's what Alyosha is hearing. And then he says, but what's this? What's this? Why is the room growing wider? Ah, oh, yes, it's the marriage, the wedding. So you see, he's kind of imagining and hearing all at once. Um, uh, here are the guests, the young people, the young couple, the merry crowd. Where's the host? Who is this? Who's that? Who is getting up there from the great table? What? Is he here too? But he's in the coffin. But he's here too. He stood up. He sees me. He is coming here. Yes. He came up to him, Father Zosima. He, the thin little old man, with tiny wrinkles on his face, joyful and laughing softly. There was no coffin now, and he was in the same dress as he had worn the day he died, sitting with them, when the visitors had gathered about him. His face was uncovered, his eyes were shining. How is this then? He too had been called to the feast. He too was at the marriage of Cana in Galilee. Yes, my dear, he said, I am called too, called and bidden. And Yosha heard his voice softly speaking over him. Why have you hidden yourself here out of sight? Come and join us too. And it was his voice, the voice of Father Zosima. And it must be he since he called him. The elder raised Yosha by the hand and he rose up from his knees. We are rejoicing, the little thin old man went on. We're drinking the new wine the wine of new great gladness. Do you see how many guests? Here are the bride and bridegroom. Here's the wise host tasting the new wine. Why, why do you wonder at me? Um, um, you, you, you too have known how to help. You've given um, 
a famished woman help today, which Alyosha had done. Begin your work, dear one. Begin it, gentle one. Do you see our son? That son with a U, S-U-N, do you see? I'm afraid I don't look, whispered Alyosha. Don't fear him. He's terrible in his greatness, awful in his sublimity, but infinitely merciful. Um, so Alyosha is lost in this kind of dream, vision, reality, fantasy. We can't really tell. But somehow it's as if his recently deceased elder, Father Zosima, has basically stepped into and stepped out of this imaginal realm. He's sort of died and he's joined this archetypal realm and he's come to visit Alyosha in it as if in a dream, as if in a kind of, you know, almost shamanic kind of visitation. He's just come to him and it actually precipitates the sort of key transformation in Alyosha's life when he is um, fully supported in a way he never had been so clearly before. And um, it's, 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 it's right here when his elder appears. Something glowed in Alyosha's heart. Something filled it till it ached. Tears of rapture rose from his soul. He stretched out his hands, uttered a cry, and woke up. Again, the coffin, the open window, the soft, solemn, distinct reading of the gospel. So now he's kind of back in normal time. But Alyosha didn't listen to the reading. It was strange. He had fallen asleep on his knees, but now he was on his feet. And suddenly, as though thrown forward, with three firm, rapid steps, he went right up to the coffin. Um, and he gazed for half a minute at the coffin, at the covered, motionless, dead man that lay in the coffin with an icon on his breast and the hood with the octangular cross on his head. He'd only just been hearing his voice and that voice was still ringing in his ears. He was listening, still expecting other words, but suddenly turned sharply and went out of the cell. He didn't stop on the steps, but went quickly down, his soul overflowing with rapture, yearned for freedom, space, openness. The vault of heaven full of soft, shining stars stretched vast and fathomless above him. The gorgeous autumn flowers in the beds round the house were slumbering till morning. The silence of earth seemed to melt into the silence of the heavens, the mystery of earth was one with the mystery of the stars. Alyosha stood, gazed, and suddenly threw himself down on the earth. He didn't know why he embraced it. He couldn't have said why he longed so irresistibly to kiss it, to kiss it all, but he kissed it, weeping, sobbing, watering it with his tears, and vowed passionately to love it, to love it forever and ever. Water the earth, with the tears of your joy and love those tears, he heard in his soul, which was another saying of his elder. What was he weeping over? Oh, in his rapture, he was weeping even over those stars shining at him from the abyss of space. And he was not ashamed of that ecstasy. Another quote of Father Zosima. Um, he, he longed to forgive everyone and for everything, and to beg forgiveness, not just for himself, but for all people, for all and for everything. And with every instant, he felt clearly, tangibly, that something firm and unshakable as that vault of heaven had entered into his soul. It was as though some idea had seized the sovereignty of his mind, and it was for all his life, and forever. He had fallen on the earth, a weak youth, but he rose up a resolute champion. And he knew and felt it suddenly, at the very moment of his ecstasy. And never, never, all his life long, 
could Alyosha forget that minute? Someone visited my soul in that hour, he used to say afterwards. Um, this is a very beautiful example. And it's so vivid and real that I can't help but wonder if Dostoevsky himself might not have known something like this. Because as you may well know famously, he faced death and he's a very, very deep spiritual human being, clearly Dostoevsky. I mean, really as deep as any writer probably who's produced great literature that's joined the Western canon has ever been. Um, right on the edge of sort of too spiritual for great literature, almost, if you know what I mean. He still knows the world of, 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 of trouble and torment and suffering so well also. Um, so he never kind of quite crossed over to being, you know, a figure like Father Zosima, who he writes about, but so clearly he writes about the way this archetypal figure, this flesh and blood person becomes archetypal for Alyosha, visits him and has this power to uh, visit him in a very sort of special way that these archetypal entities can. So now, have I, have I conveyed this uh, clearly? I don't know. I'm probably going to have to talk more about it because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that um, in a way we, we could hear about more and get clearer on, but this is not sort of magical. It's not, um, it's not actually <laughs> sort of totally irrational. It's just when we lessen our hold on knowing ourselves and our world the way we think we do, when we lessen our conviction that we know those things, as practice softens us in our holding, it weakens our hold in a beautiful way. It allows us to release our grip on how we think things are. And we don't have to know an alternative. It's so beautiful. It's not that we've got to let go of one kind of knowing in order to have another kind of knowing. No, all we have to do is soften our grip you can feel it, some little clutch, some little contraction in the heart, in the solar plexus. It's a physical thing. If we sit enough, it becomes clearly a physical thing. What is it just to allow that and let it soften, let it soften. It softens and somehow it softens us. You know, because this way of trust and support that I'm talking about, it's about not having to change anything. It's about doing less, trusting more. We sit and we may have a little checklist of things we think we're supposed to do, a little sort of algorithm of how practice works and what it can bring about. This is saying, don't worry about that. Put it in your back pocket, put it on the shelf, forget about it. Don't do anything. What is it like when we practice not doing anything? Well, you see, it takes a bit of trust, doesn't it? What is it like to go through the tiny little barrier of pain, resistance, whatever it is, into that trust? Just... Um, Letting it be as it is, exactly as it is. Letting the grip go, letting the hold go. Let your mind become kind of soft, even a bit confused, it's okay. This Buddha, Dharma, Sangha complex, you know, Yes, it's on a sort of knowable level and is also on a less known level as well. And it's got us.
all of it, the, the, you know, it, it knows us better than we do. This is a long seasoned practice. It's done, you know, 2,500 years, but probably 25,000 years, who knows? Probably, maybe we go back to the Mesolithic, the Paleolithic, maybe we go back to Homo erectus. I don't know, you know, where, who knows how far back we go? If the contention of original love is correct, we can go back all the way. This practice emerges with existence itself. It's no other than existence itself. Origin, origin point. Somehow still here. So actually this little archetypal thing is only a it's only a it's only a stepping stone. It's not it's not so remarkable after all. So as we sit together, just, you know, letting breath breathe you, letting sitting itself sit, letting this moment, just as it is, be you. Have all the sense experience of this moment as we sit. Let it hold you completely um, to the extent that you don't have to do a thing. Uh, true support, thorough, thorough support, holding you, being you actually as you sit. You might have this little thread of mood if you're sitting with Mu, fine, a little thread running through it, a little stream of Mu running through it. Let that also be what you are. And trust, trust all these thousands and thousands of years of practitioners who are sitting here with us, who are here, supporting our practice here and now. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. And um, on we go. We'll have a, a little break and then resume sitting. Thank you so much.